Good afternoon, Manchester. It's uh, quite interesting to be here because uh, up to 28 years ago, I used to live 35 kilometers uh, from here in a small place called Skelmersdale. And I don't think that at, at the time I would have imagined standing in front of this crowd talking about BGP. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm Job Snyders from NTT Communications. And today I would like to discuss with you the topic of how to build robust routing policies. So I'm not going to dive deep into how to implement specific features such as black holing or, or uh, prepending based on communities. I want to talk about the foundation underneath all of that. How do we talk about routing policy? What makes good routing policies good and what makes bad routing policies bad? Um, to achieve this, I'll we'll, we'll, uh, we'll share with you a conceptual model uh, we came up with to discuss the topic of routing policies. I'll offer you some terminology that is perhaps useful in discussions with your colleagues. And then I'll go over various design patterns uh, that have been identified over the years that are either good or, or bad. Uh, and to collect these design patterns, I talked with numerous of my colleagues, but also uh, colleagues from competitors, and asked them what makes good routing policies good. And from that, uh, this presentation was derived. So the conceptual model, uh, as I would like to present it, is that there is attachment points and directionality. Um, there is a Dutch saying uh, from Dick Hout Zagman Planken uh, that translates roughly to one man's eBGP out is another man's eBGP in. And these are not necessarily the names of the policies you'll apply, but these are the types of policies that exist in your network. And it's always good to uh, uh, specify whether it's external BGP or internal BGP and what the direction of the policy is. I strongly recommend to use separate policies for the separate directions that exist. Um, if we take an iOS example, uh, or Brocade, or whatever the flavor of the day is, the attachment point is where you associate a given routing policy with a given BGP neighbor. The direction is where you specify whether this applies for what you receive from this neighbor, or what you're sending towards the neighbor. Um, then policy is the totality of all the separate terms. Uh, on Junos, for instance, this part actually is called a term, uh, and the policy is, the, is called a policy statement. Uh, so these are useful words when you're discussing uh, the design of routing policies. We'll, we'll go through each of the attachment points, and I'll uh, try and clarify what types of actions are useful at what types of attachment points. On eBHP in, uh, which is the attachment point where I parse updates that I receive from my BHP neighbors, that's where I do uh, two phases of filtering. The first phase of filtering is that right off the bat, you reject routes based on certain characteristics. And we'll, we'll go over some of those characteristics in subsequent slides. Um, but there's a component where you'll, you'll reject updates based on just one aspect of the update. An example could be if there's a private ASM anywhere in the AS path, it's rejected, even though the prefix in and of itself and the BHP origin could be valid. Then phase two, is where you only accept what you previously configured as what I call a whitelist. The whitelist is uh, the potential of announcements you expect behind a certain eBHP session, and if an update comes in that is not on the whitelist, it's dropped. Um, the raw input is what in ITF speak is called adjacent rip in. And this is the list of prefixes without any filters, without any modifications, as your neighbor sends it to you. And it is this piece where maximum prefix uh, limits are applied. Uh, we'll cover maximum prefix uh, in, in detail in subsequent slides because there may be some interesting uh, details about that that you're not familiar with. Um, 
The adjacent rip in can contain anything. There are no rules about that. We cannot predict what a neighbor will send us. <coughs> Maximum prefix limits are a very cheap and cost-effective mechanism to mitigate negative effects should something in the network go wrong. Maximum prefix limits are an uh, interesting part of, uh, um, if you go to these two links, you'll, you'll find all kinds of uh, technical terms about how control theory works. Uh, but maximum prefix limits are fascinating in how they work and protect our networks. Because essentially, it's a trick to say, we don't know what's going wrong, but if this uh, uh, threshold is met, we blindly execute some action, for instance, tear down the BHP session. And while the machine is doing this in a really dumb way, because the machine does not understand what is happening or, or cannot interpret the leak, uh, uh, from a practical perspective, this is very desirable behavior and saves all of us uh, quite some embarrassment. So let's go over how we think uh, maximum prefix limits work. And in this context, they are applied pre-policy. Um, on the left side, we have uh, uh, a set of announcements that are valid. Uh, the x-axis is time. And perhaps the engineer on the other side of the BHP session made some kind of misconfiguration. For instance, they uh, are suddenly announcing a full table. So over time, more and more routes are announced, uh, which were not intended to be announced, and that's why we'll call them invalid. And at some point, a threshold is met where uh, your router concludes that, hey, I'm receiving 20,000 prefixes, and the maximum prefix limit is also 20,000, so I'm tearing down the session. And from that moment on, we are both safe because I'm no longer accepting your leak. Uh, and and uh, that, so it's a mutually beneficial uh, aspect to tear down the session when it comes to internet routing. Now, what happens when you apply limits post policy is very different. Again, we have the same scenario. Over time, more and more uh, routes are announced. Um, there is a bunch of routes that will invariably make it through the whitelist because no whitelist is ever a perfect filter. Um, and then perhaps the policy rejects sufficient routes so that the leak never hits the maximum prefix value. Uh, NTT had this a few months ago where a customer leaked uh, a full table to us. Our filters killed 97% uh, of that. And because our filters were so effective, the maximum prefix value was never hit. And then for one or two hours, there was still a number of paths, a few hundred via this leaking pair uh, that should not have been there. In other words, uh, pre-policy and post-policy maximum prefix limits have very different consequences for the safety of your network. Pre-policy maximum prefix limits are useful to protect the memory on your router on your site, uh, and they are useful to protect against route leaks. Post-policy limits are useful to protect against RIP or FIP exhaustion. Maybe you have a device that can only store 64,000 routes in its FIP, and then it may make sense to apply a post-policy limit to ensure you never sent more than 64,000 routes to the FIP. Uh, and another scenario where post-policy limits sometimes are applied is in context of layer-free VPNs, where there's a contractual agreement that each spoke of a layer-free VPN can only announce, say, 10 routes. Uh, but in the internet use case, uh, pre-policy limits are most valuable because they protect against route leaks. And now if we look at the vendors, anybody from Cisco here? Uh, would like to have a chat. Um, on Cisco, the concept of pre-policy limits does not exist. On an iOS XR or an iOS XE device, you cannot configure a pre-policy limit. Uh, so that's, that's annoying. Uh, and when you type in the phrase maximum dash prefix, that is in effect a post-policy uh, enforcement of these maximum prefix limits. On Juniper, it's different. On Juniper, you have prefix limit, which is 
uh, pre-policy. And for post-policy, you have accepted dash prefix dash limit, so you can configure both. But if you configure keep none and prefix limit together, in effect, it will also be a post-policy uh, limit. So be good to verify in your router configs whether you have uh, keep none configured and whether that aligns with your expectations of the behavior of the router. Uh, on Nokia, it's different. There only pre-policy exists and no post-policy exists. Um, and then there's some other variants. But it's, it's important when you make assessments of your router vendors to verify whether your expectations of maximum prefix limits actually uh, align with reality and whether that, that is what the vendor is doing. Because to me, it was quite a surprise when we made these uh, tables. Um, then there's another type of limit that does not really exist in the wild yet, but which I would like to exist more, outbound maximum limits. I think it's really useful that if I, as NTT, know that uh, the current internet routing table is, say, 750,000 uh, prefixes, um, that if we start announcing more than a million prefixes, we should proactively tear down the sessions because clearly something somewhere is wrong. And in self-destructing uh, uh, in, in such a context, uh, we'd be doing our neighbors and ourselves a favor. Only BERT from NextCZ today uh, supports outbound uh, limits. Uh, and I think we should go to IETF and specify how an outbound limit works and then encourage vendors to uh, allow us to configure such things. Um, and, and this way we can protect each other. All right. Um, back to, to the flow of filtering in eBHP in. We covered raw input, the adjacent rib in covered what uh, maximum prefix limits are doing in that context. Um, and now let's step through the Venn diagram. So as I said, if a route somehow falls in the bad category, reject it. And reasons to reject routes could be uh, private ASNs anywhere in the AS path, private uh, prefixes or, or the RFC 1918 space, uh, leaks, for instance, if we see level 3's ASN on, in the AS path received on cogent BHP sessions, that is a leak or some complex hijack form, and we'll reject that outright. NTT calls this peer locking, um, and more is uh, described at this NLNOC URL. Of course, IXP more specifics, so the more specifics of the peering LAN prefixes, Always reject those. Accepting more specifics of an IXP peering lamp can only result in tears. Uh, RPKI invalid announcements are another contributor to the class of bad routes. And finally, your own space and more specifics of your own space are often not something you want to accept from eBHP neighbors. This does not apply if you're a CDN and your deployment is all separate islands, but this assumes you have a coherent backbone. Then there is the whitelist. The whitelist can be generated through various means. Uh, you can query the IRR system to uh, create a list of prefixes you potentially accept behind a given eBHP session. We can use RPKI information to generate whitelists. And this is a beautiful thing with RPKI. You can not only use it for origin validation, but also in the provisioning process, you can use RPKI data uh, as a contributor to the whitelist. And these days, NTT tells its customers that customers can either register route objects in the IR or register RPKI ROAS or do both. They all have the same meaning. All right, now that we've constructed a eBHP in policy and have uh, analyzed various aspects, uh, let's zoom in on a different aspect of these policies. Famous Belgium saying from uh, Eric Loos from Belgacom, he once told me, when in doubt, always use BGP communities. BGP communities are the tool of choice to make networks uh, scalable, 
and reduce the uh, workload when you need to provision uh, something somewhere. A BGP community is defined as a group of destinations which share a common property. And English not being my native language, I think the word community is terrible in this context and has caused a lot of confusion for me and other coworkers. I wish they would have just called it tag or label or marker or well, anything other than community. But this is what it is and we'll be stuck with this name for the next uh, uh, decennia. BHP communities can be used in uh, what is commonly seen as a, a two-step process. Step one is classifying and then adding a BHP community, and then step two is executing based on communities that were set in step one. So common classifiers uh, you'll see in, in BHP network deployments is that there is a community for learned from a customer, or a community for this route was learned in Europe, or uh, this route was learned via a specific upstream provider. These classifiers can later on help you in the decision process to decide what routes do we want to announce to which eBHP neighbors. Common execution outcomes could be do announce to this eBHP neighbor, or uh, do not announce, or prepend the AS path once or twice, or actions like these. So we classify, and then we execute. And RFC 8195 provides a study resource that uh, in much detail uh, iterates over what you can do with this uh, in context of large communities. But that applies to smaller communities as well. So with this in our minds, let's step through the, uh, a day in the life of a BHP announcement. I am AS15562, and I'm announcing a IP4 prefix to AS2914, my upstream. The routing policy at the eBHP in attachment point on 2914 site uh, will not reject the announcement because it's part of the whitelist. I registered an IR object. Uh, it's not a bogan. There is nothing fishy with the AS path, so it, it makes it through that phase of eBHP in. Then still inside eBHP in, uh, the 2914 policy will classify which city or metro or country is this route picked up, attach appropriate BHP communities. It will classify the route as something learned from a customer. Uh, and then uh, the route moves through the policy to the next step. Then still in eBHP in, you execute features because maybe I requested that the upstream provider will manipulate the local preference or manipulate the local preference only in certain regions of the world or do a black hole or whatnot. All those features are still part of eBHP in style policies. Uh, then finally, the route is admitted into its local RIP and it will propagate through iBHP out into uh, the next attachment point, IBHP in. Uh, IBHP out is the most boring attachment point. Uh, in many networks, there's not a lot of things that happen at that particular point. But IBHP in is uh, an attachment point where you can enforce, uh, the, for instance, regional products. If you sell partial transit that only applies to Europe or only to Asia, uh, Generally speaking, in IBHP in is where you enforce the uh, characteristics of that product. It makes it into IBHP in, uh, makes it into local RIP, and then it goes out to neighbors uh, through eBHP out again. And this attachment point is where you will perhaps do some prepending or suppression of announcements if the customer had certain communities set. So this is the classifier execution matrix uh, for a simple transit network. If the route was learned from a customer, in eBHP out, we will announce it to other customers, to other peers, and to other upstreams. If the route was learned via a peering partner, say private peering or an internet exchange, on eBHP out, such routes will be sent to customers but will not be propagated 
to other peers or upstreams because, of course, there's no financial incentive to uh, propagate routes to, from non-paying partners to other non-paying partners. Uh, similarly, if you learn a route from your upstream provider, you will announce it to your downstream transit customers, but you don't want to announce it to peers and upstreams. And now comes a very important one. If there is no classifier, reject on every type of eBHP session. In other words, if there are no BGP communities on a route announcement that allow it to be announced, you should never propagate it to others. Uh, and this is an incredibly useful uh, safety device in network architecture. Because, for instance, what happens if you uh, connect a BGP speaker to your network and for some reason you're not, you did not configure any policy uh, on some devices, such as Cisco IOS, that means that all routes are accepted, all routes are propagated, because that's the default behavior of uh, such devices. And if on your eBHP out policies facing your peers, your customers, your transits, you have no way of blocking uh, such announcements, you'd be uh, propagating them everywhere. Um, so it really pays off to make sure that in your routing policies that if, if there's no reason to allow a prefix through based on the BGP communities you associate with, with the route announcements to deny uh, uh, the propagation of such prefixes. Uh, this really prevents a lot of different types of misconfigurations and problems that may arise in your network. And, and this is a beautiful thing with BGP communities, as your network grows, Using BGP communities is the, the, uh, the cheapest way to let things scale, because the alternative would be to manage your network based on AS paths, AS path filters and prefix lists, and that means that every time you add uh, a new customer or a new prefix to your network, on every edge router, you'd need to update the outbound prefix lists. By using communities, you only need to touch the uh, portion of the network where you're actually provisioning the new customer. Um, so this is all in all a, a great time saver. Um, so rejecting routes that do not contain the proper BGP communities that would allow them through the policy, we call this robust termination of the routing policy. And it is in essence a fill closed mechanism where you prioritize security over uh, other considerations. All right, completely different type of advice, but avoid regular expressions where possible. I mean, is this a curse from a comic book or a regular expression? You tell me. Code as if the next guy that has to maintain your routing policies uh, will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. Write routing policies for readability and don't try to be clever. I, I've myself made this mistake where I'm like, oh, I reduced these 10 lines of uh, conflict to just one line by making this exorbitant uh, uh, regular expression. And then later on, I had to conclude that that was not in anybody's interest. And a, a great advantage is if you avoid regular expressions, that common Unix tools like grep uh, have a higher chance of actually pinpointing you to two parts of the conflict that you're interested in. Another thing I'd like to recommend, uh, some things should just not be mixed, however delicious it looks. One of them is Jägermeister with warm mayonnaise. Another thing is IPv4 and IPv6 uh, policies. Make sure you define separate v6 policies for your v6 neighbors, separate v4 policies for your IPv4 neighbors, keep the prefix lists apart, Give them different names. Uh, this way, you will reduce the chances of ever running into uh, weird corner cases. Because on a lot of the platforms, it's not really defined what happens if a v4 prefix goes into uh, a match that only has v6 prefixes. Will it fill open and pass? Will it fill closed because the API is wrong? Uh, there is no real industry standard in this regard. Different vendors have different types of behavior. So especially in multi-vendor networks, uh, 
life is much, much simpler if you separate V4 and V6 as much as possible. I also recommend to never run uh, advertising V4 prefixes over V6 prefixes. From a debugging perspective, uh, it, it's, it's quite challenging. Uh, so every AVI should have its own BHP sessions, and that gives you the most flexibility, but also the most uh, clarity. Um, another aspect we can highlight, so you can verify whether the way you are doing things in your network aligns with how I am doing things in my network and, and uh, try to express in this presentation, uh, is to consider how much separate BGP policies do you actually have in your network today. Um, when it comes to eBGP in, you'll need a separate policy for each peer, for each upstream, for each customer. And that's because of the, uh, the whitelist and, and the bad list. Uh, the whitelist will differ from peer to peer. Uh, each customer has a different AS set, a uh, different autonomous system number, and that means that the list of potential prefixes is separate from customer to customer. So how, for, for every eBHP session facing a customer, you'll have some eBHP in policy uh, specific for that session. But on the flip side, eBHP out is often shared across groups of peers or groups of customers uh, because they don't differ from each other. Uh, upstreams may also share the, the same eBHP out policies unless you have specific uh, traffic engineering features where you allow suppression towards specific ASNs. iBHP out usually is a copy paste across the entire network whereas iBHP in is a per device specific policy. And that's because of region, uh, regionality uh, where you, uh, uh, for instance, allow policies or traffic engineering features that there's different behavior on different continents. So to put that in a table, uh, eBHP in will be n times the amount of eBHP neighbors times two for V4 and V6. Uh, and in NTT's network, you're then looking at tens of thousands of discrete policies spread over the all devices. Uh, eBHP out is per group, so upstreams, peers, or, or uh, downstreams. Uh, in, in our network, that uh, then you'll end up with something in the high hundreds. iBHP in is per device, so we're in the low hundreds. And then iBHP out is network-wide, uh, one per AVI. And we, we have uh, a very small amount of that type of policies. Uh, another hint I'd like to give you is to avoid the uh, paradigm of set community X. We've discovered that different vendors have different behavior. Um, on some implementations, when you do set community X, it will delete all the communities associated with the route announcement and then attach the community you want it to set. On other implementations, it will delete some of the BGP communities, not all of them, and then add X. Other implementations will not delete any communities, but just add uh, the community you requested. Um, and given the wild variance we've seen across Cisco, Juniper, uh, OpenBHPD, uh, others, uh, I have given up on set community X. As a configuration syntax, it simply uh, often does not do what you expect it to do. So it's easier to just explicitly delete the communities you want to delete through, say, delete community Y, and then add uh, the community explicitly by using the additive keyword. And even though this may grow your configurations a little bit, uh, the behavior you'll see across platforms will be more consistent. Uh, and another data point, uh, when we implemented support for Graceful Shutdown, a well-known BHP community that signals uh, that the BHP session is about to go down, um, uh, we discovered that, that implementing that feature while using set community X uh, at the same time was incredibly hard uh, 
So we deleted uh, tens of thousands of instances of this set community config snippet uh, to, to uh, make our life easier to implement that specific feature. Uh, you can click this URL to find a, a more elaborative description of how uh, implementations differ when it comes to setting communities. Um, finally, when it comes to what communities should we delete, my recommendation would be delete as few as possible. Because even if you're not interested in the, uh, in the community, maybe some downstream network somewhere else does benefit from having access to that information. Uh, so by deleting as little communities as possible, we create opportunity for third parties to perhaps to improve traffic engineering. Uh, on the flip side, if you set communities and distribute those to your neighbors, I would ask you to be considerate and don't set more than three or four communities. Uh, when you're setting 30, 40 communities on a route, you should consider doing some cleanup to reduce the memory load on your uh, neighbors. And this may be the only place where using a regular expression in routing policies is acceptable. For instance, if we want to delete all communities related to our network, uh, it's of course nice if we can use a regular expression to delete 2914 colon uh, dot asterisk. Uh, this RFC 7454 has BGP operational considerations and elaborates further on the concept of scrubbing communities. What communities should you send to your neighbors? Uh, high on the wish list of all the, uh, uh, the parties that are outbound heavy is that you at least send something that signifies geolocation. This way they can try and optimize to deliver uh, you know, from a uh, Manchester cluster to prefixes that actually originated in Manchester uh, and try and keep local traffic local. And publicly document what your communities mean. Don't put it behind some login, don't put it in a customer portal, be public about it. Uh, this way you increase the chances of the information uh, becoming available to consultants some other company may have hired or to researchers that are trying to understand the internet. Uh, this is my penultimate slide. Uh, I'd like to draw some attention to RFC 8212. This is an RFC that uh, specifies what the default behavior of eBHP sessions should be. Previously, in IETF uh, context, there was no definition of what a BHP uh, speaker should do when an eBHP session comes up. Should they announce all routes, accept all routes, not announce anything, only announce what originates in the uh, self-ASM uh, or some other variant? All possible permutations existed in the wild, uh, and this makes life tricky, especially in cross-vendor uh, networks when you, you have, for instance, Cisco IOS XR, which by default does not announce anything if, unless you configure it to do so, whereas uh, Junos by default will announce its full table unless you configure it to do otherwise. And these discrepancies across vendors are harmful for our operations. Uh, so this is where uh, we, we came up with the idea of specifying it. But Publishing an RFC is only part of the journey. It's also getting all vendors to implement said RFC where uh, a big challenge lays. Um, so in terms of progress, iOS XR, BERT, and OpenBHPD support this RFC. They have safe, sane behavior. Uh, on Arista, you can enable, emulate the behavior by typing in these two lines, but it's not the default out of the box. Uh, on Junos, you can use a Slack script to emulate the behavior, but again, that doesn't exist out of the box. Uh, and Nokia is planning on support for 2019-2020-ish uh, timeframe. So my ask to you would be, ask your vendors, specifically Junos uh, and Arista, uh, to implement support for this RFC. All right. Uh, we've now arrived at the end of my presentation. Uh, with this, I would like to open up the floor for any questions or comments you may have uh, based on what I told you.
Rogue Gouding, a stadium. Rogue Gouding. Rob Golding, a stadium. Um, you said um, you set it so that you drop outbound if you exceed the max prefixes. Does that not mean potential access issues to the equipment to fix whatever config is causing the max prefix? Um, great question. It depends. Uh, in, in the case of NVT, we have a separate, physically separate network from our production network where we purchase from our biggest competitors uh, who have the least chances of uh, having overlapping routes with, with our own network. Um, and that way we can always revive uh, the network uh, via someone else. Okay, so but yeah, it's, it's indeed good to consider what happens if there's a catastrophic meltdown. And I think some form of out-of-band network that does not depend on your own infrastructure uh, is a necessity. And for some networks, it may be as simple as just getting a 4G modem, uh, install that in a small Linux box, and connect the Linux box to the serial port of, of the router. But you've got to think about that. Hi, David Friedman from Clarinet. Just a, a quick comment about um, policies in IBGP on iOS XR. Um, there's a, a magic uh, knob that you have to enable in the configuration in order to change anything in IBGP policy. Um, if you don't have this, you'll uh, spend lots of time and effort and frustration and tears in getting it to work. Um, I think it's IBGP enforced modifications or something like that. And uh, it's not really well documented. Thank you. Hi, Ian Cleary, Google. Um, just a quick question around the IPv4, IPv6 policies. Uh, is this something reflected in differentiation for NTT in the peering policy between v4 and v6? Or is it just a, a network level? This is just a network level. Uh, with some networks, we may have only v4 sessions. With some networks, maybe only v6 sessions. Uh, the, the key point I try to, to bring across is that if the peer has the same ASM, uh, make sure that for both address families you have a separate eBHP session and that for each eBHP session you have separately configured routing policies. And of course, routing policies are not peering policies. They are technical constructs, whereas the other is a, a commercial or diplomatic uh, uh, construct. Thanks for the clarification. And never do V4 over V6 BHP sessions. That's like the worst of it all. Any other questions? All right. Um, if you have questions later or would like some clarification, my email box is always open. Feel free to reach out, and I'd be happy to uh, give you feedback on whatever problem you throw my way. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you, Job. That was great.